It is a great honor and a personal pleasure to be interviewing Lila Gleitman. I first met Lila in the spring of 1971. That's 46 years ago, for those of you who are having trouble doing the math quickly, when I was applying for graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania. So at the time, it was not at all surprising to interview with faculty of a place that you wanted to go to. The surprising thing was that Lila wasn't at Penn. She was actually at Swarthmore. But it seemed clear to me that if you want to do something in language acquisition, which I did, and you were anywhere in the Philadelphia area, you had to go and interview with Lila. Even in 1971, Lila was doing strikingly original work on language and learning that was changing the face of psychology and cognitive science. So I came with my honors thesis from Smith College in hand, and I was doing great explaining all of the control groups and the data, which in itself was a little difficult since I brought this project back from the University of Geneva with Piaget. And you know, Piaget really didn't do control groups, but I was doing great. I really thought I had it until I was stopped in my tracks when Lila asked me why I did the project. So this was a highly embarrassing moment, but as you can see, it was an important one because I've remembered it for over 40 years. And that was the first time, but not the last time, that Lila taught me that doing a study elegantly and carefully is important, but then knowing why you did it is even more important. And you should be able to talk about what that study is about to anyone, preferably in terms that your grandmother can understand. So this is a fundamental lesson about science that I learned from Lila even before I started paying tuition. So Lila's research findings, which date from the 60s, have energized the fields of psychology, linguistics, and cognitive science, and have spawned research programs that define current investigations of language and language learning. And Lila is, if anything, more active and productive now as we just heard in her inspiring plenary address last Thursday. Lila has received many well-deserved honors. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's won the Distinguished Scientist Award from APA, the John McGovern Award in the Behavioral Sciences from AAAS, the Prix International from the Fisson Foundation, and my personal favorite, the Mentor Award from APS. In addition to doing research noted for its originality, clarity, and depth, Lila is an inspirational teacher and mentor, and her students currently populate psychology and linguistics departments all over the country. So Lila's goal is to unravel the mysteries of how children learn language. Her fellow graduate student when she was studying linguistics at Penn, Noam Chomsky, approached the language learning puzzle by documenting the principles underlying the linguistic systems that children learn. And because those principles are not transparent in the linguistic input that children receive, Chomsky assumed that they had to be innate in the world, in the child. But Lila's approach to the problem of language learning was and is different. She conducts empirical studies of the language learning process itself. While not denying that children come to language learning predisposed to learn human language, indeed, Lila is one of the most significant and influential proponents of this position. Lila bases her claims on careful and very clever empirical investigations. So two themes run through Lila's research. The first is to discover how language learning is constrained, what endowments do children bring with them that narrow down the set of languages they can learn, the second is to understand how children learn the particular language to which they're exposed. What processes do children use to extract units and meanings from the input they receive? In other words, how does it work? Well before it was fashionable to be interdisciplinary, Lila was already forging the ties that now bind psychology, linguistics, and cognitive science. She's fostered the marriage of ideas through her own work, through the many students she's nurtured, and through the interdisciplinary cognitive science program she co-founded at Penn, which had a really defining effect on the field. We'll hear about each of these influences in a moment. Psychological science would look very different were it not for Lila Gleitman. She's one of those rare people who has altered the course of intellectual inquiry, and she's continuing to do so. As you will no doubt be able to tell for yourselves, the minute Lila starts talking, she is from Brooklyn, not far from where Bernie Sanders grew up. So today's interview is really the story of how a kid from Brooklyn found herself 
in the middle of a cognitive revolution in the 1950s. And not only witnessed that revolution, but was central in shaping its growth and direction. This revolution is now completely taken for granted and is the background for really everything that we do. But Lila was there at the start, and she can tell us about it. So let's start at the beginning in Brooklyn. And as I understand it, Lila, you started your career at James Madison High School, which surprisingly has spawned many well-known people. You want to tell us a little bit about James Madison High School? Uh, well, James Madison High School was a urban uh, school with a mostly secular Jewish uh, clientele, what do you call the students, <laughs> student body. Uh, and uh, this was um, uh, in the uh, early 1940s, I guess. There was a war on, there was a war on. Uh, that colored everything. You might want to tell them which war. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you can guess. The Second World War uh, uh, what, uh, was then on and uh, colored uh, our lives in some background way. Uh, but like high schoolers everywhere, it was mainly about ourselves as high schoolers. So it was an interesting school. A lot of interesting people came from there like Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, and um, Judge Judy <laughs> <laughs> and um, Chuck Schumer later, uh, Bernie Sanders, these people came later. But so, so it was a nice, um, uh, relatively nice place to be, although myself, I was uh, sort of an unfocused outsider uh, uh, for most of my high school career, I remember it mainly as a fog. Uh, I don't really remember too much about it. And so from that fog in New York, you ended up going to Antioch in Ohio. So how did you manage to get to Ohio from Brooklyn? Uh, Antioch, do you know what Antioch is? Antioch was a left-wing, militant, left-wing, lunatic, swear, lunatic fringe, how I got there, I mean, it was a natural place for me to go, actually. Uh, but we did not have, or at least I did not have, uh, any counseling. But I remember there was a very large desk, uh, and there were brochures from colleges all over it. And I wasn't too keen on this idea of going to college. It all seemed uh, pretty... Uh, uh, alien uh, uh, to me at the time, but I happened to pick up this brochure for a college where you didn't have to be in college all the time, only half the year, and half the other half of the year you would go out and work on co-op jobs. And that sounded uh, great. Uh, and um, I, I really didn't have much of an idea of what the college was about, which was wonderful if you were political, uh, but, but that's how it happened. I just found a brochure on the desk, and that's where I went. And so psychology didn't really grab you at Antioch. What did you major in? Uh, at Antioch, uh, English literature. Because everybody majored in English literature. <laughs> well, it was wonderful. I always loved to read novels and so forth and so on, but even in college, I wasn't particularly focused, uh, uh, just vaguing around. <laughs> and so then from there, you went back to New York, right? Yes. And you looked for a job as an editor. Yes. Actually, I was the editor of our little uh, college literary magazine, which was called Idiom. And... Um, I went to New York with a friend, a very interesting friend. His name was Elliot Fremont Smith. And in the left-wing uh, uh, proletariat ways of anti-ecology came to be called hyphen. Uh, so hyphen and I went to New York. So I, had been, I was the editor, and he had been the assistant editor. So this is 
the one woman's story. I'll tell you what it was like being a woman those days. So we went to New York, uh, and uh, I don't know how this, well, morning came, and we went out looking for jobs. And we came back that night, and he had gotten a job as a um, uh, entering a junior uh, edit, editor of, um, at Doubleday. That was wonderful. And he went on to a very nice career, became uh, um, the editor of the Village Voice, eventually followed that trajectory. I came back uh, and I had gotten a job as a gal Friday for the Journal of the American Waterworks Association. Okay, so you notice the disparity? But we're talking, what, 1948, something like that? Uh, no, it was later than that, 1952, but it doesn't matter. It was the bad old days, it probably still is. Uh, the disparity in what employment we were able to get was not even noticeable to us. We had a glass of wine, you know, we toasted each other for the wonderful jobs. But you know, my job was, um, I got the coffee uh, and I typed the envelopes uh, and I didn't stay there. I mean, it was, it was sort of a, I mean, I'm not saying no women succeeded, but it was kind of a dead end. And um, the fact that, w that women ended up as gal Fridays I mean, that's such an undignified word in, in retrospect. So, so that's the way it was. So there you were being a gal Friday, and now how did you get to psychology? Well, there was again, life is a series of accidents. I went and visited some friends at Dartmouth, I think, uh, uh, that summer. Uh, and there was a guy there uh, who had just gotten his first job as an assistant professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. That was my first husband. Uh, I, he wasn't my first husband yet. It took a little longer than I had to meet him <laughs> first. Uh, but so we rapidly uh, hit it off. We got married and that was really great. Uh, and that's how I got to the University of Pennsylvania. So who was this first husband? Because he's not uh, insignificant in the cognitive science revolution. No, no, he's a very interesting, very smart man named Eugene Galanter. Some of you old timers will remember the name. Uh, and it, there was sort of a dawning uh, uh, a change uh, going on in psychology and everywhere, as we'll see s s soon see in linguistics and uh, the emerging computational sciences. Anyhow, he uh, uh, notably wrote a book with George Miller, Miller, Glanter, uh, and Prebrim, uh, and it was called Plans on the Structure of Behavior, uh, and it was very controversial at the time. Structure of behavior, I mean, sort of, sort of an oxymoron from the point of view of the preceding associationist uh, a generation. So there were jokes around, disparaging jokes uh, about the book, which said, uh, how did the expression go? Uh, Miller devised it, Galanter wrote it, and Prebrim believed it. <laughs> Did you have, Barbara, have you heard that joke? Uh, so it was quite, quite controversial, but it had an effect uh, it, uh, in this dawning um, so, change of perspective. So Galanter was really significant in writing this book, but the other way in which Galanter was significant is he got you to Penn. Yes. And that changed your life. Yes. So tell us how that changed your life. Well, uh, again, I, I was a s sort of unfocused person intellectually. Uh, and, uh, but when I married him, he was an assistant professor, it turned out women could take courses free uh, if you were a faculty wife, you could take courses free. And that's what I like to do. Uh, 
So I took more courses, so I decided I'm going to learn Greek, uh, and I'm going to do some of those things which, as an English major, which was wonderful, and which continue to occupy my interest for life, uh, find out something about the, it was the 20th century at that time. So I thought, I'll also take an undergraduate uh, uh, sequence in mathematics, which I, I had, had uh, done nothing like that uh, uh, in college. And there was, I was very devoted to Greek culture. So uh, as it panned out, uh, the mathematics uh, uh, trembled uh, uh, along in, in, in the background. Uh, but the study of Greek became my first real intellectual focus, something that kept me up night and day, translating sentences. Well, yes, you figured out you had no intuitions for mathematics, and you were great. V very at little, very little. So, yes. but you, but you also, I think, discovered at that time that it really wasn't the culture of Greek that you were interested in; it was truly the language, right? It was truly the language. And it was Henry Honigswald who helped you discover that. Yes. So why yes. don't you tell us a little bit about Henry Honigswald? Well, Henry Honigswald was a brilliant historical linguist. linguist. Uh, and maybe for those of you who know linguistics, maybe, maybe the um, uh, major figure uh, in developing the comparative method uh, by which you could not completely quantify, but close to quantify the relationships among languages, how language, languages change and grow and diverge uh, and uh, uh, come together uh, over historical time uh, and place. Wonderful, brilliant Indo-Europeanist uh, as well. Uh, but of course, he was a teacher in a big university, so he had to teach introductory Greek among uh, other things, but he was very patient, that was fine. Uh, and uh, introductory Greek, but you know, if you were a normal person and you teach Greek, you talk about, as you're going through the text, you talk about what's going on. And I recall this, it was a fateful day, and uh, he, we were translating sentences, and then he, and there was something about Alcibiades, who was a big dandy of, um, of Athens. And he was saying, oh, in that year, I don't know, 430 BC or something, everybody in Athens was wearing Alcibiades sandals. Uh, and I remember saying in some surly Brooklyn way, okay, parse the next sentence. Okay. And uh, so we went on. Uh, and, um, and he buttonholed me at the end of the, the class. And he said, you know, you're in the wrong department. <laughs> and I know my face fell, okay, because I was determined to be this great Greek scholar. Uh, and he said, that's okay. It happened to me too. I moved to the linguistics department. You should move to the linguistics department. So, and he's the one who graciously gave you up as a student, as I understand it, and introduced you to Zelig Harris, yes. which is yes. another pivotal point in your life. And, but he said to me that day, and you won't work with me, you will work with, and his, his face was kind of shining, you will work with Zelig Harris. Uh, all of Penn and much of the linguistic world was devoted to, to Zelig Harris for very good reason. So you came in as a linguistics student yes. to lingu Zelig Harris's lab, and the first thing he did was tell you you had to go find a job. The first thing he said is that he forgot to apply for the scholarships. Yeah, <laughs> so get, get a job. So. All right, so tell so us a little bit. So I had to get a job for a year, yeah. And tell us a little bit about this job, because this job's pretty interesting. Well, I got, remember I had connections with psychology. So I got a job at Eastern Pennsylvania Psychiatric Institute. There was a psychiatrist. And the psychi this psychiatrist was something of a, I don't know what to call him, but he said, oh yeah, I'm gonna hire you as a structural linguist. I had been in linguistics for what, six weeks or three <laughs> weeks or something like that. Uh, he had, you know, you put on the door, 
the name of the person, and underneath it was in uh, structural, Lila Glanter, structural linguist. Okay, so he hired me for his own purposes. Uh, and not too much happened, but something did happen. Something did happen, so tell us about he that. He had gotten the contract to write the psychological entries for the next edition of Webster's Dictionary. And that was quite interesting. Uh, so he decided that I should do it. Okay. Uh, and it's wonderful, you get 100 cards. I mean, I think they have troops of monkeys that type the uh, 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 100 cards on which your mystery word has occurred somewhere. So you get a little paragraph, a text, uh, and you get about 100 of them. Uh, and um, you're supposed to riffle through those and figure out a, a paraphrase, pre presumably, that will um, um, be the dictionary entry uh, for that word. And a lot of funny things happened there, of which there was another person working as a secretary there, a woman. I love this story. She came in, she said, what are you doing with those cards all the time? And I can imagine how proud I was. I said, I am writing the definitions for Webster's Dictionary. And she said, how do you do that? So I thought about it for a second. I said, well, I make them up. <laughs> she said, you? <laughs> and then she said, I always told this to my undergraduates. You make them up? I will never look up a word in the dictionary again. <laughs> that was so wonderful, because people think the dictionary came from God. You know, it wasn't God. It's an unemployed first-year linguistics student somewhere. All right, so tell us about that famous word that you got into the dictionary. Oh, yeah. So, yes. So this was also wonderful, because, believe it or not, among the psychological words was the word fuck. And actually, it was quite interesting. We won't talk about that, but those of you who have thought about symmetrical predicates uh, uh, can realize that fuck is quite an interesting word, like marry or equal or so forth. It behaves in very interesting ways. Uh, so that was my first approach to that. But, but the interesting thing is the upshot. Forever, I have taken it as my chief uh, accomplishment in life that I'm the gal who put the word fuck in the dictionary. <laughs> that may not be your, your most. <laughs> not we'll, see. we'll vote at the end of the interview to see. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's go back to Harris a little bit, because he okay. did a little bit more than just get you yes. underemployed. Yes. Um, he had a very important theory, and I think it would be good to tell the, the group a little bit more about Harris's theory, because I'm not sure that everybody understands what Harris was about at that time. Well, Harris was the pinnacle of structural, structural linguistics, you know, which had been developing in, mainly in America for 50 or 70 years, and was parallel to the behaviorist revolution uh, going on in the next departments uh, uh, in psychology. Uh, and uh, uh, basically, it was a procedure uh, for building the whole structure of the English sentence, starting at the very bottom with the lowest level items and everything uh, then grouped together by class inclusion. So you had the phones and the phonemes and the morphemes and the words and so forth. And what the theory was, was how you get there. So we can't talk about that theory, but to get an idea of, of how this all worked, you remember the game Hangman? Okay. So as each person chooses a letter, the options for what can come next and be a word of English get narrower and narrower and narrower. So when it gets down to only one, you lose, okay, uh, in the game. Uh, but so that was be a discovery procedure. He wrote a very famous article called From Phoneme to Morphine. Mm -hmm. Okay? 
about the, the distribution of items at the level below. And then from morphine to phrases, from phrases to sentences, and so forth and so But at some point, that, that's the story. You broke with Harris because his, his, his theory wasn't working for everything that you were thinking about. And that was a pivotal moment, too. Right. So to put that in a nutshell, OK, uh, what Harris, the, the idea of transformations was Harris's idea, although in Chomsky's hands it became a very different thing. Uh, and so he was trying to talk about the relationships among sentences. OK, so he was trying to go up level by level, level to a discourse for that matter. Uh, but at any rate, uh, in order to do, in order to analyze sentences, the idea was they all had to be reduced to one normal form. One normal form, okay? So you had to see the relationship between the active and the passive, for example, because the passive is just a distortion of an, some, I wouldn't say underlying, because he would turn over in his grave. Right. <laughs> uh, but for every sentence of this kind, there's a sentence uh, of the other kind, okay? So what did, what, what so, did work So here was the shock, okay? And here we go with symmetrical predicates again. I was doing conjunction. So you get sentences like John and Bill walk and the, under, and the source sentences of John walked and what do they say? and Mary walked. Very good, you could write a little algorithm for that. Uh, but I ran into a, a set of funny cases, like John met Mary. Isn't John met and Mary met? And, and you can go through the fuck example for yourself uh, again, <laughs> as, as, as one of these. the these. Oh, and two and two is four wasn't a combination of two is four and two is four. That just won't fly. There's something wrong uh, with the, um, uh, what that pointed to, of course it's just a particular, points to a place where the theory cannot handle a particular kind of data. Uh, and should make you look around. But Harris wasn't so flexible because at that point, the fact that this, this uh, idea didn't fit with this theory was enough for him to say, out, yes. go. And you never finished your dissertation with him. No. Right? As a matter of fact, my daughter Claire and I had d dinner uh, with um, Noam Chomsky the, the other night here before the convention started. Uh, he had also been a... And, and, and Chomsky says, you know, Harris thought when his, after his book came out, that was the end, it was all done, linguistics was finished, and there was nothing more to do except some details. Uh, and so he was not really good uh, at um, confronting these kinds of challenges. Right. So, never mind me, there was, grew a separation uh, 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 between him and Harris, uh, uh, and, and Chomsky had uh, quite different ideas right. about the forms of the grammar and what the grammar was telling you about the human mind. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So before we just go to Chomsky, tell, tell us what, because Harris, although you broke with him, he did set the stage for some of the theories that you developed that are really important. Do you want to tell us a little bit about? that idea of reverse engineering that you've talked about? Well, this is hard, okay. But remember there was this distributional analysis um, of um, uh, distri relative distribution. This was not frequency distribution. The relative distribution of items in a linguistic string. So. It was sort of a discovery procedure, okay? So if you started out, I mean, if you could imagine a child starting out, your mother is saying blah, 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 and uh, you do something like hangman and discover the morphemes, and then you do something like higher level hangman. That, that's sort of the idea and build all the way up. There's something to that, 
I'll tell you what's to that. Everything that every time you look up something in Google, you're sort of making use of Heresian ideas, Harris, Heresian ideas, which have become extremely popular because you can do a great deal of work. Right. So if you try to think about meaning, oh, that's very, very hard. But if you try just to think about distribution, it turns out that all the words that mean the same thing occur in the same place in the same structures. So the structure of the, of the language uh, imposes a coarse semantic partition, or, or as fine as you like, depending on the units you choose. It imposes a semantic uh, partitioning uh, uh, of the words and phrases uh, 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 and so forth. And it does that quite well if you ignore the, I mean, there's some warts, as I tried to say before. So, um, and it but, does but, it. But you can do a lot with that. Yeah, it does it well enough. So, one of your theories is that children make use of that structure oh, yes, children. in their I language learning. That. Right. Okay. Right. So, back to the child, remembering <laughs> what the child is hearing is blah, 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 blah. Okay. And um, somehow or other, the child has to connect these structures at various levels with what's going on in the world, presumably. I mean, that's the first thing you would think. Okay, so this isn't just like the next mathematical theory. It connects to the world. Uh, and it's, you have to discover that John saw Mary means John saw Mary, and it doesn't mean Mary saw John, and so forth. Uh, well, all of that semantics, presume the, uh, the structure is, is um, uh, arises from that semantics. That's true, but it arises as a very complex uh, uh, organization of right. that semantics. That the child can take advantage a child, of. The child's right. got to un unravel it. I mean, how's a child supposed to know that John saw Mary and Mary was seen by John being the same thing? Okay. Even worse, how would you find out even what the words meant. Okay, so everybody starts from this intuition that um, this is easy, pretty easy, okay? So when a tiger walks by, that's sort of a, a, an occasion in which you're likely to hear the word tiger. So here's how the child learns the lexicon of the language. She notices that the sound tiger occurs most systematically in the presence of tigers in the world, and the least systematically in their absence. That's wonderful. Okay, so now all you need is a theory on each side. But it turns out, okay, the problem is this. There's a, maybe a lot of tigers in the world, but not everything is like tiger. Mm -hmm. You have right. also have to learn words like think, Okay, so let's consider think for a second. Suppose the people in the center are thinking, and the people over there are not thinking. Okay, suppose that's really true. So I say, Susan, these guys are thinking. Those guys are not thinking. Hmm. She can look earnestly around. <laughs> oh, it's clear, they're not thinking. But you can't, it's so yeah. clear. <laughs> yeah, you really can't tell, mm -hmm. okay? So think doesn't reveal itself uh, uh, in any simple way uh, from observing the world. And it gets worse. So you need the structure of language, really, to yeah. understand, which is really, so, so this is an idea that yeah. also came out of perhaps what Chomsky taught you. He was your fellow graduate student. He also broke with Harris. Uh, and he had a big impact on your thinking. So, well, not only my thinking yeah, well, had a big impact on all oh, of yeah, I know, thinking. but, but you're, yes. the, yeah. you're, the, you're the lady of the hour today. Okay, yes, so, right. <laughs> so how did Chomsky change the way you started to think about things? In a way, he got you, he's a linguist, but he got you to psychology. So tell us about that. Well, well uh, something worth reading is his 1965 book, Aspects of the Theory of Syntax. Uh, uh, in which the opening chapter, as many linguistics books 
the opening chapter is about psychology. It's about um, okay. Okay. Uh, how people get to use uh, language. So if there are any linguists here, if you read Leonard Bloomfield uh, talking in the structuralist framework, he'll say the sorts of things that, that we just vaguely went over. Uh, if you only knew exactly the circumstances under which a person heard sentences, you would be able to predict exactly what you're saying. Later on, you could read this in Skinner's um, famous, infamous uh, book, uh, uh, Verbal Behavior. Right. right. Okay. Uh, predicting from the world uh, what you would say. Right. And Chomsky said, this is not going to work. Okay. But, so what you introduced, remember, yeah. it, so then you came back, right? Yeah. You did your dissertation. Yeah. But in fact, you sort of did a, a dissertation in the psychology world, and you did it with Henry Gleitman. With Henry Gleitman. Well, not I mean, he wasn't yeah. your advisor, he was your yeah. spouse, so that didn't yeah. really count. Um, but you did it with, I think, Henry Heesh, right? your advisor? I didn't really have an advisor at right. that time. So I had a, a real break with my advisor. This is not a wonderful position for a graduate student to be in. Uh, my, advi my mentor, my actual mentor, Zelie Garris and I, weren't even speaking right. uh, at this point. So somehow or other, through the intercession of the saintly Henry right. Hernigsvon, uh, I managed to uh, reinstate myself enough uh, to get um, uh, uh, a degree. So, so there tell, really wasn't a big advisor. Right, and this, this project was really pretty based in, in language behavior, right? It was based in language behavior Which because... Which was different yeah, from Chomsky's ideas. Like, an, really like any normal uh, American semi-intellectual, I found what Chomsky said... Uh, in his book, uh, that I found one thing after another completely ridiculous. Okay, so Chomsky was saying, for example, this is where my dissertation came in. He was saying, all human beings come to native level knowledge of their language in the natural course of informal exposure, and they're all the same. And after all, I came from a background in English literature, which I continued to admire. And I thought, well, huh, Willie Shakespeare and I are not of equal competence <laughs> in English. <laughs> so there are systematic differences here. So in my usual way, and I think many of us would recognize this, I thought, I'll fix you. I will show you unequal competence. Uh, in the human population. Uh, and I sort of devised sort of an experiment in which people were asked to um, uh, paraphrase sentences like black housebird and blackbird house and house, housebird black and housebird black and so forth and so on. And indeed, they varied very extensively in how well they were able to do so. Which was a surprise, given... It wasn't a surprise to me. To you, but was it was a surprise, theoretically. Okay, yeah. see that, and right. I wrote a sign. Right. And we're writing this book, we're writing this book. Okay. Then Henry Gleitman, who was a very smart, educated, thoughtful man, who kept saying to me, you know, you can't shoot down this guy, Chomsky, with a pop gun. Uh, <laughs> right. That there was something wrong with them, um, something not thoughtful enough about the way, by the time we got to the end of the book, The important part of it was not that people differed, but that the same theory, you needed the same theory to describe all of them, so that in a right. deeper sense, uh, indeed, they're all the same. Of course, there are all these superficial differences. How big is your vocabulary, and blah, 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 and how well can you paraphrase compound nouns. But what you can do, what, what, what the whole population can do, mm -hmm. such that they can read the ads. So, and the, is, is in this year, right? 
so the, you took advantage of data from adults, but you yeah. also started to look at data from children, and you did that with your colleague Liz Shipley, and you also sort of took advantage of the fact that you had children who were teaching you a little bit about language learning. Yes. So that was another, I think, that was, change uh, of in course, your life. another big thing which settled the rest of my life because, uh, you know, one can enjoy, you know, drawing trees, syntactic trees, uh, on the blackboard uh, for the rest of your life. But then you see a kid learning a language, it's a miracle. And again, I always maintain this sort of know nothing, very behaviorist orientation. I mean, the world kept saying no every time I tried to show this, but I kept on saying it. So as far as language acquisition was concerned, I don't think I really believed in it. You didn't uh, believe that they acquired language? Is that That's they, right. Okay. I mean, that's what is, how, could, how could that be possible? They couldn't uh, do it. So I had a kind of a transformative experience one day. Uh, this was in the old days before there were seat belts and before you made your little kid sit in the back of the car. So I have with I had with me my three year old. This one is sitting over here now, uh, actually. Uh, and uh, we were in the car and, and we're coming to a curve. And I s said to her, "Hold on tight." And we go around the curve, and we come out the other side of the curve. And this little voice says, "Isn't it tightly?" <laughs> I said, "I can't believe I'm hearing this." So really, I think your your insight was that kids know a lot more than we they think know they know. They know a lot more so than what, they so say. So just yeah. tell us a little bit about that study that you did with Liz, which was really pretty important with Liz Shipley. Yes. Well, you know, as soon as you get anybody who's thought at all about linguistics uh, into whatever the psychology of language acquisition, they'll say language learning in young children, you look at the psychological literature at that time, and we're talking now the early 60s, uh, and it says boring things like um, at age such and such children have a vocabulary this size, and then you look later and it's bigger, and they have graphs, and they're smooth, and so forth. Uh, utterly uninformative, and in many ways besides the point. Beside the point. So any linguist, anybody with the slightest linguistic training, walk into that situation and say, yeah, but does what they say exhaust or even properly describe what they know. So, you know, linguistics proceeds not by writing down the sentences that you utter, at least post-Harris. It wasn't just writing down the sentences that you utter, but the judgment sentences you judge to be grammatical. Okay, sentences. But you, you can't ask a little kid to judge. Well, so what did you do? You, you did something clever. Right? Well, Implicitly, you can ask a child, okay, to, um, so here's a sentence, um, uh, uh, Johnny, ball throw, okay, uh, and then just watch what the kid does. What the kids did, I mean, it was astonishing, was sort of fall to the ground, there was a great deal of keening, there was p kids putting their hands over their ears, uh, and running out of the room, the mother was the one saying the stimulus. So when you, we said these weird sentences, okay, we had, the mother had a script to offer these sentences, grammatical and ungrammatical, and we're talking about kids who said things like ball throw, okay? <laughs> I mean, they couldn't say more than two words at a time. But they knew. But they would not okay. accept those two, same two word sentences from their mother, okay? They showed a great deal of rejection, emotionality, and they would not carry out your command. But if you said, throw me the ball, they'd just throw you the ball, and, and that was that. So this focus on data is something that has carried, it certainly influenced you, but then you brought that idea over to your students. So let's talk a little bit about the many people you have influenced and that whole program of looking at language acquisition. Um, 
by coming up with clever studies. Yes. Well, I'm not so sure that you and I, even today, agree <laughs> to this extent. The linguists were doing clever enough studies. Oh, as Obama said to Hillary, uh, you're clever enough <laughs> uh, if you ask people for judgments of grammaticality. Right. Because the data aren't your problem for, for a long period of time. Uh, the data are, are uh, very easy for people to generate. Okay, so if you say to somebody, house the is red, uh, they say no, the house is red. So people have this, this um, to some extent, uh, an ability not only to talk and understand, but to comment, uh, uh, to, they have some access uh, to those facts. So. I think of linguists as having been experimentalists all along. Right. I'm not arguing, actually, that there's okay. no data in linguistics. I'm okay. really not. Okay. What I'm arguing is that, or suggesting, is that yeah. what you brought in was a different kind of data that was really yeah. helpful in fleshing out these theories. So the work that you did with Barbara Landau and with Lisa Newport and the work we did together was all sort of subsequent to this, and it was generated in part by the need for more different kinds of data. Uh. Yes, because if you start, as we did, as I think any sensible person would, uh, by saying uh, uh, it's obvious that um, language is learned on the basis of very specific input data. That's why all the kids in England learned English and all the kids in France learned French. So the, what you learn about language is a function of the input. It, that, at that gross level, that's certainly true. Okay, so how refined? Can you really make a theory in which you can relate, as, as Bloomfield uh, claims, if you read the first chapter of his book, that if you can find out exactly what the input was, you can predict uh, uh, what will get learned right. uh, in, in the long run, right. okay? So what we set out to do, our group, uh, Lisa Newport, you, Barbara Landa, uh, is to ask ourselves um, uh, if you change the input uh, to the child, if you look at different kinds of input, can you predict uh, exactly how language acquisition will grow in that population? Okay. Uh, and over and over again, as we did this, in several studies, God kept saying, no, you're wrong again. Right. Okay. Because if we changed the input first with Newport, just looked at people in the normal range, the mothers in the normal range, mothers and fathers, uh, and the growth of the children, okay, in some very clever kinds of analyses, we couldn't predict much a little bit, but negligible, about the growth of the language in that particular child by properties that we could identify uh, in the input. So we wrote a paper which was based on an advertisement at the time. The paper was called, Mother, I'd Rather Do It Myself, right. uh, which was an Excedrin ad. Uh, 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 at the, the time. time. So all of these studies really speak to that first question that you're very interested in, which is what constrains the child. Right. But then at Penn, you were at Penn at this point, and you hired John Truswell, which allowed you to get into another whole set of studies and to start thinking about how the child takes those constraints and learns a language like English. Yeah. So can you talk to us you a little bit about that? You skipped over 30 years. Because I, 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 really, I know. Yeah. But that's because we don't have that much time left. Okay. <laughs> but these input studies, okay, became more extreme. Right? So, so now we can refer to really interesting, serious people like David Hume. Okay? So if you were blind, you certainly couldn't understand words like look and see. Right? So Barbara Landau and I, right, so 
change the circumstances of learning and you can predict what the child said. So, the, so in just in one sentence, the astonishing finding was the first verb in the blind children's vocabulary was C. S-E-E. -E, <laughs> with look not far behind. Okay, I mean, this begins to have an effect on your behaviorist leanings here, on your uh, uh, idea that there's something simple about the input and output. And of course, I, with Susan Golden Meadow and Heidi Feldman, we then began to look at, well, what if you didn't hear the sentence, mm -hmm. but you could interpret the world, right. right? So by varying these inputs and outputs, uh, 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 so we were looking for that Harris's discovery procedure, right. but instead we found uh, much to support a kind of Chomsky, or should I say platonic, to be fair, um, uh, outcome uh, that kept confronting us was right. that the child rose above the limitations uh, of the input. And, all of and these they all construct a grammar and a semantics of essentially the same kind, if they're humans of normal mentality. So these really, these, these are great ways of discovering the constraints that children bring to language learning. But of course, a child has to learn the language to which that child is exposed. And that was another whole set of studies yes. that you really made great major yeah. contributions to. Well, I don't know if major, but I fell in with a, um, a young, uh, 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 psycholinguistic, I, I was getting old by that time, a young psycholinguist whose name was John Chuswell, uh, uh, okay, uh, who had uh, been very involved with um, sentence processing and, and so forth, how you understand a sentence in the moment, uh, and, uh, and produce issues of production and, and comprehension uh, which are foremost in many psychologists' minds, largely separate from the issue of, of acquisition. Uh, and so we were in different places. I mean, we weren't, into, we weren't theoretical opponents or anything, but we were, mm -hmm. seemed to be interested in different things. But actually, after all this structure, semantics, and, uh, relative indifference to input comes about, you do learn the meaning of the word tiger by noticing that there's a tiger walking by. Mm -hmm. And that simplest of all the problems, for 30 years I had never thought about. Okay. Uh, and. Um, Truswell and I forged a collaboration, which I think uh, was very good because it drew us um, both back into this nexus of all of these problems in how the child moves from an initial state right. to knowledge of the language. Right. So and that's what we're still doing. We've been working together for 20 years now. It's, and it's a very, very, another class of problems. Right. So you were there at the very start of this revolution, this cognitive revolution, which sort of made it. It got its place when you created, you and others at the University of Pennsylvania created IRCS. That really put the cognitive revolution sort of on the map. So tell us a little bit about the state that um, the field was in at that point. Okay, well again you created. want to be careful because uh, unlike um, uh, Gore was it, I didn't invent the <laughs> cognitive revolution. You did? Okay. No. Oh, I'm disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> but actually when I arrived at Penn was a very wonderful time, okay. Uh, first of all there was this visionary and computational person, Zelie Garris, okay. Um, and uh, Penn had been, Penn people, Eckert and Muckley had been material uh, people in making the first v viable uh, computers. Uh, and um, uh, they were stolen, of course, immediately by the Rand Corporation, which gave Penn ENIAC and then UNIVAC. 
uh, and Harris foresaw uh, uh, computational linguistics. Uh, um, so how you could formalize and implement um, a theory of language of the kind that he had. So I walk in on this, and I had the background, background I deeply respect, but very different, uh, of a person who read novels and a little poetry here and there, okay? And he said, well, so here you are, and you're going to uh, implement something about English uh, on a computer. And I said, what is, what's a computer? <laughs> I never heard of a computer, but I, in common with most people at the time, I had never heard of it. We were really talking 1960, okay? And he said, don't worry, there's a young engineer uh, in the engineering school uh, at Penn, and he has agreed to teach you how to use a computer. Uh, and the guy's name was Arvind Joshi. Uh, and I hope you know him. Maybe he's the dean of, of um, computational linguistics uh, uh, then and, uh, and now. And, but at the time, he didn't know anything about linguistics. He was just, this guy was supposed to teach somebody how to use a computer. And uh, what the computer was to do was to analyze English sentences. And I looked at the computer and said, never saw anything like that. And he looked at me and he said, the computer wasn't designed to do English sentences. It was designed to do numbers. Uh, but we were very young people and we began to see it mm -hmm. uh, 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 right away. Uh, and in another sense, we worked together for the rest of uh, right. our and lives. You, and uh, the two of you formed the, formed the Institute. Institute for Research in Cognitive Science, which began to bring together in, in our shop, and again I say, uh, this isn't the only place it happened. It happened in uh, uh, maybe a dozen or 20 uh, uh, universities where people from different departments were realizing that they had been working on the same issues mm -hmm. all the time, and they were first getting together. So then we got together with them, um, you know, people in robotics and people in philosophy and linguists, psychologists, and so forth for a couple of years. Uh, and and uh, eventually this institute started with big pushes from first the Sloan Foundation, mm -hmm. okay, and, uh, and then the National Science Foundation. And that's yeah. cognitive science. That's yeah, and today's that's cognitive, cognitive science. science. Do you want to yeah. say a word about where you think cognitive science is now? Uh, well, it's certainly a lot more enlightened now, I suppose, but it always looks, everything looks rosy about uh, uh, today. Where is cognitive science? Well, I don't know. You know, uh, the era I'm talking about was a very optimistic era when all these fields were coming together right. uh, uh, in very fruitful ways, and I think very fruitful things happen. I mean, think about people like Fodor. I mean, we're coming from all... Uh, 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 kinds of backgrounds into, and 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 maybe the the apogee here was this this book, Syn um, aspects of the theory of syntax by Chomsky, where linguistics was really making big progress uh, in this interdisciplinary way. But you know what happens in science? You look at the details, and the theories theories never work, so they begin to f fall apart together. And I think we're in sort of a parlous period now, okay? We have those big data people. Okay, I say those. I should say these to be a little more n neutral. You have big data people who are saying, you know, we can beat this problem to death uh, <laughs> if we only give the kid, let's say, 500,000 uh, form to meaning pairings for tiger, I bet the kid will learn tiger. Say, but the kid learned it in one trial. So, what is the five? What does the big data got to do with it? And now, and I mean, I'm sure there were no, there were really three huge things. Neuroscience says, oh, we don't have to do this stuff by inference anymore. Just open up the brain, look inside, and you'll see the real theory. So, so there's the neuroscience, 
and it's developing in its way, and there's uh, big data, uh, which is developing theories about the same thing, but in quite a different way. Uh, and then uh, linguistic psychology, which is a tr tradition which continues where it was before. And these things aren't meshing at the moment. But they will. Of course, they must mesh, and they will. Right. But this is not a great movement. ERC's, by the way, Institute for Research in Cognitive Science closed last year. Finished. Uh, mm -hmm. So you were there. You began it. It is not over, even though it irks. In some ways, cognitive science, that revolution is taken for granted now. It's sort of, maybe it doesn't need to be an institute because it's everywhere, and maybe not. But do you have, after looking back at this whole wonderful career that you've had, any advice for young people just starting out? Uh, yes. Uh, don't do what your teacher did. Uh, <laughs> everybody's wrong. Uh, and, you know, the warts will set you free. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, and it took me a long time to learn. Uh, and a lot of wounds and misdirection. Uh, but um, uh, what really doesn't pay is to do the next exp experiment that's on your lovely mentor's agenda that usually won't do much. Okay, okay well, that's excellent advice for all the young people here to defy their advisors. That yes. seems like just, you know, just what we <laughs> all, just what we've advisors <laughs> wanted to hear. <laughs> Thank you, Lila, that has been a wonderful tour through your life. Really Thank you. Very it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.